Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're taking a look at a really cool rifle. This is one of SMG, Smith Machine Group's, uh, reproduction first pattern, specifically Type E, FG-42 rifles. Now the FG-42 was developed as a paratrooper-specific rifle in Germany during World War II, and it was supposed to be, like the requirements set out for this rifle were nay impossible to meet. And yet Louis Stange at uh, Rheinmetall Borsig managed to put together a rifle that almost met all of them. So uh, I've talked about what what led to the requirement for this gun in the past, but just to touch on the high points if you haven't seen any of that, basically German paratroops early in World War II had crummy parachute designs, they had a single attachment point on the back, and because it was very difficult to drop with heavy weapons, what they did is they would drop the men, and then they would drop all the heavy weapons, like the MG-34 machine guns, in a separate container on its own parachute. Uh, none of these parachutes were steerable, and what inevitably happened is that the guys would end up over there, and the weapons containers would end up over there, and the troops that they dropped to fight would end up right in the middle, and the paratroops would have to do a lot of fighting with just backup uh, weapons like pistols and hand grenades that they did actually have on them. So the idea was let's get them some sort of uh, uh, general purpose uh, sort of rifle that can do everything. Because the important thing is this has to be not just a rifle, but it also has to serve as a light machine gun, because it needs to replace the MG-34, which is much too bulky and heavy to drop with a paratrooper. So the requirements were initially set out in November 1941, and they were, wow, it was like a list, an impossible list of requirements. This rifle had to be less than a meter long, which they did actually pull off. It was supposed to weigh no more than a Car 98K, less if possible, but it also had to be self-loading, had to use detachable magazines, in this case uh, ZB26 magazines, which are remarkably similar to the actual FG magazines, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Anyway, it had to use detachable magazines, it had to be capable of both semi-auto fire from a closed bolt, and also fully automatic fire from an open bolt, because you wanted the accuracy of a closed bolt for single shots, and you wanted the cooling uh, of well, the, the cooling effect on the barrel, and also the immunity from cook-off that you would get from having an open bolt gun and full auto. So it had to do both. Uh, had to have a bipod, had to have a bayonet. It also had to be capable of serving as a sniper slash marksman's rifle. So it had to accept a telescopic sight, and it had to be as accurate as a K98K because of that. Um, and oh, while we're at it, let's also throw in that it has to be capable of launching rifle grenades. Uh, it doesn't have to do it by itself, but it has to be able to take a rifle grenade spigot. So we want all of that. Um, not a problem, right? Well, two companies did actually submit prototypes. They were Krieghoff and Rheinmetall Borsig, and Rheinmetall Borsig would win this contest fairly easily. Um, Louis Stange was their design engineer. He had quite a bit of other small arms experience. He was a very talented designer, and he managed to pull off almost all of the, the German requirements for this gun, which is really quite remarkable. So uh, he had his first prototype built in February of 1942. It was it left a lot to be desired. By May of 42 it had been substantially improved. There were a series of field trials uh, later that year in September of 1942. It was actually type designated as Fallschirmjager Gewehr 42, or FG 42, that's paratroopers rifle, model of 1942. And the intent at that point was they were going to have 2,000 of them available by Christmas. That did not happen, that came nowhere close to happening. It would take about an extra year for the rifles to actually get in the field. Now by early 1943 they had actually produced 200 of these guns for troop trials, and that's kind of where the, the speed of the program ground to a bit of a halt. It is not entirely clear why, but probably a combination of two main factors. One, the strategic materials required to build this rifle, in particular its rather complex milled receiver, were becoming scarcer, and it was starting to become clear that this would be a problem in the future. It's not so much the machine time, although that was the thing, but in order to properly harden a the receiver for a rifle like this, if it's being made out of a single block, you need to have some specialized alloys, and Germany didn't have a good supply of those alloying elements required to make really high-grade steel. Making stampings 
maybe counterintuitively, requires substantially less specialized and less high quality, I suppose, steels. And so anything that could be stamped, they wanted to stamp. And that was already a thing that was becoming clear before the FG42s were put into the field. The second thing is that Rheinmetall Borsig had won the competition for this rifle, and yet the actual contract to build the guns in bulk for the German Air Force went to Krieghoff, which is probably because Heinrich Krieghoff, who owned the company, was buddy-buddy with Hermann Göring, who ran the German Air Force. And there would be, you know, Rheinmetall had done all the tooling up and all the design work and had a good understanding of the gun. Krieghoff did not, and yet it was going to be Krieghoff that had to build them, so there was a substantial delay to get Krieghoff tooled up to make the guns. Ultimately, that 2000, those, those initial 2000 guns wouldn't be built until October of 43, and it would take a couple months after that. It wasn't until the early month or two of 1944 that those rifles, those first 2000 Theoretically, the first production batch of FG-42s were actually in military service. Now the rifle did see combat sooner than that, because those 200 troop trials guns did end up getting used. Primarily in Italy, um, the, obviously the most distinctive place where they saw service was in September of 1943, when the Luftwaffe under uh, a small unit under Otto Skorzeny ran a really impressive uh, special operations rescue to get Mussolini out of captivity on the, at the Gran Sasso. They did that with glider-borne Fallschirmjager troops armed with FG-42s, and there are a number of very famous, well, you know, lo widely published photographs from that raid that show guys with these rifles. So they were specialist rifles, they were recognized as being good guns, but there just weren't really any of them around in substantial quantity until early uh, 1944. Now, with that in mind, let's take a closer look at this thing, and let's see how SMG did their reproduction. Let's start out at the muzzle end of the rifle here. We have a different style of muzzle brake from the later FG42s. This is what the early pattern were made with. We have a folding front sight, and that is a very typical German barley corn style sight. It folds down both uh, to keep it from being damaged while jumping, and also because you don't really need it sticking up if you're using the optical scope, the optical sight. When they were doing the initial development work on some of the very first prototypes of the FG42, there was some question as to whether it would be better to mount the bipod back here at the midpoint of the barrel, or out here at the muzzle. They would eventually choose the muzzle for the second pattern, but on this first pattern they opted for the midpoint of the barrel. What they found in testing was that it was basically better to have the bipod back here for full auto fire. Uh, for one thing, it allowed the gun to pivot more easily. Um, which allowed the, the shooter to track a moving target, as well as cover a sector of fire more effectively. It also meant that because the bipod folded forward, uh, the shooter could actually lean into the bipod, put weight on the gun to help control it in full auto. And as a result, they found that full auto dispersion was better set up this way than if they had the bipod out of the muzzle. However, putting the bipod out of the muzzle tended to give better semi-auto groups, because it was a little more stable for the shooter. However, it made it more difficult to traverse the gun, and the guns tended to fall backwards, uh, or to fall forwards and fold up the bipod legs on full auto fire. So obviously they went with uh, the other option when they revised this to the second pattern gun, but what we have here is the setup from the original first pattern with one change. That change is an optional element that Rick Smith at SMG has in the guns, namely a spring-loaded catch right here. What this does is lock the bipod in position unless you pull this down, and then you can fold it up. That catch was not on the original guns, but frankly it's a nice element to have to prevent the bipod from unexpectedly collapsing and I thought it would be nice to have. It's, it's a good option for me on this example. Also point out the bayonet here. Um, on the original FGs, these were, well on the very first FGs, these were actually cut down French Moss 36 bayonets. Uh, the Germans of course started their own production when they were building the rifles in quantity. Um, the 
bayonet there just flips around, actually attaches just like an FG42, or just like a MOS36. This one is a cut down MOS36 bayonet, because that's what's available uh, for SMG to use. This is to me very much like the bayonet on the US Johnson rifle. It's kind of stupid and pointless, but the requirement said that it had to be there, and so let's come up with the lowest profile, easiest, just knock it out of the way and don't have to worry about it solution. And a MOS36 bipod certainly does that, or bayonet certainly does that. Alright, we're going to move back to the scope uh, real quickly here, because it's really cool and it stands out. Uh, the original scopes on these first pattern FGs were ZFG42 scopes, which differ from the later uh, standardized ZF4s. We'll talk about the scopes more in a later video. Uh, this particular scope uh, is also a reproduction, it's a reproduction mount, and it is actually a reproduction made from a reproduction Russian PU scope. So the brass out here on the front, where the original German scopes were made with brass tubes, for a variety of reasons, like it was easier to machine, uh, this is actually a threaded on cap over the body of the PU scope. What's nice about this is that the PU has its dials on the exact same, in the same orientation as the original ZFG42 scopes, which is, by the way, different from the ZF4s. So uh, the German scope was originally basically copied from the PU, so the PU makes a really good op option. Uh, to build reproductions of. Now the mount here has a single lever on it. If we open this we're going to rotate it just that far, and then we have a nice tight fit on the scope body here. There we go. We can slide that right off, and the way this thing mounts is not through tension, but rather through a semicircular locking lug on the back of the scope mount. So this is the removal position, where you have a flat cut so it can slide off. When you lock the scope in place, what you're doing is actually locking it into this cutout. So you're not dependent on tension, and this should return to zero after being taken off. And then sitting under there we have the original drum rear sight, which you can then lift up to actually use. This scope mount is numbered to the rifle, uh, and this is the, the same style as the original scope mounts were actually done in. On this side we have markings that are actually copied uh, down to the exact digit uh, from the one surviving uh, original example that's pictured in Death From Above. And you can't see it all that well, but we have the, uh, the Russian PU reticle, which is basically a, well, which is a German post and basically identical to the reticle design in the original FG scopes. Here on the rifle we have a duplicate of the original German marking, so it's marked FG42 with a factory code FZS, which was Krieghoff. Uh, serial number on this one is 44, that's not supposed to be a date, that's the serial number. We have a series of Luftwaffe uh, acceptance proofs on the side. The FG42 was actually not a Waffenamt rifle, because it did not go through normal German army uh, procurement. It was procured directly by the Luftwaffe. So the markings on them are a little different than what you would expect on a typical German rifle, uh, and of course the reproductions match the originals. The modern markings are nice and nicely hidden really on the bottom of the magazine well. Um, they're exposed there enough to meet federal requirements, but they're in a position where you're really never going to see them uh, unless you uh, have specifically go looking for them. The magazine that uh, SMG chose to build these rifles around was the Czech ZB26 light machine gun magazine. 20 round capacity is identical to the original FGs, 8mm Mauser chambering. Uh, this is the one that came with this particular rifle. Uh, and frankly these look very, very similar to original FG magazines. So they really they make a very, per uh, a very obvious, a really perfect choice uh, to build the rifles with. The magazine well is distinctively on the left hand side, and uh, as is correct for the first pattern of FGs there is no dust cover on here. We have a relatively small uh, magazine release, which is also authentically appropriate. Originally the hold open was automatic, but it was a part that was prone to significant uh, failure. And so SMG faced with the question of do we reproduce a part that we pretty much know is going to break, because they did originally, or do we leave it out? 
um, they opted for a middle route, which is this is a hold open that works manually, uh, but not automatically. It's the automatic element that was prone to breakage. So uh, if we pull the bolt back, open, press that button, and then let the bolt go, that button stays down, the bolt stays retracted, and it is much easier to reload a new magazine. Uh, once you have the new magazine in, just pop the bolt handle back slightly, and it will close. I should also point out there is a brass deflector on this rifle because I am left-handed, <laughs> and uh, Rick was kind enough to put it on there for me. There are photos in Death From Above of one prototype first pattern FG that had a shell deflector just like this. It was not on the standard production first pattern guns, but it did come back and was used in all the standard production second pattern guns. So that's why there is a brass deflector on this rifle, uh, but not on most of them. Of course we have the very distinctive, very sharply swept back pistol grip. I suspect that this was done uh, in order to mimic the handling of a Car 98K, although that wasn't specifically required uh, in, in the a list of requirements for the FG, but I suspect that's why it was done. It was not well liked, and the second pattern guns have an almost perfectly vertical grip. This works. Um, it's something you get used to. If you have particularly large hands, your hand can actually have trouble fitting in here. For me, not, not that big a deal. I kind of like it. Um, the safety on this side is of an interesting sort. This is how the original worked as well. There's a spring-loaded plunger here, and there are actually two holes in the pistol grip assembly. This is the fire position, that is the safe position, and you can't just push the safety, you have to actually lift the plug and then rotate it and let it snap into position. Uh, for left-handers this is really awkward because it sits right under your trigger finger. However, if you un unsnap it and just push it all the way forward, it remains in the semi-auto fire, uh, well it works as a semi-auto position, and it is then nicely out of the way of your trigger finger. So if you're left-handed, just roll the thing all the way forward. That's what I've been doing, and it works just fine. The original buttstocks for the first pattern guns uh, were stamped. These remarkably have actually been milled by SMG because, well, basically because they didn't have the infrastructure to make stampings for what is a relatively low production gun. Well, what is a very low production gun. So they actually milled these things, which is really remarkable to me. Um, the quality looks great, they look like they're stamped, um, everything fits together very nicely there. Now let's go ahead and take this apart. We have a button here that allows us to detach the stock. It is important to compress the buffer spring when you take the stock out, or else you will wear on the internal uh, edge of that button, and it will stop working after a little while. Alright, so I did this off camera because it's hard to coordinate. Basically, put the stock in your shoulder, pull the gun back, push the button down, and that allows you to pull the butt stock off. Um, by the way, this reproduction weighs in at almost exactly 5 kilos. That's like 11 pounds, 1 and a half ounce, which is virtually identical to the original FG-42s. Um, it is a heavier gun than it looks like, but it's also heavier than it feels like. Uh, it's a nice svelte, fairly compact design that uh, it carries very nicely. I was surprised that it weighed as much as 11 pounds. Next up we're going to remove the buffer spring at the end of the recoil assembly. This we do by pushing this lever down and then rotating it 90 degrees. There we go. So that releases our buffer spring. And we can then pull out the actual mainspring and its guide rod. Now the action of the FG42 is very much Lewis inspired, and it's an unusual mechanism where we have to actually cock the striker spring at the very first bit of recoil travel. So the charging handle in these is always stiff. It's true on the repros, it was true on the originals as well. And you're gonna basically pull this back until the bolt has rotated and cocked the striker spring, and then it can move fairly freely. Bring the charging handle all the way back, and we can pull that out. Note that it has a little cutout in the front. There is actually a plunger uh, inside the operating rod that is pushed on by the mainspring that locks this in place uh, so that it doesn't go flying out of the gun. Now we can pull the bolt and 
operating rod out. And there are those. We'll touch on that in a moment. Then we can pull the pistol grip off. Do that by you push down just slightly on this spring, pull it down, and then it disconnects. And then we have two cross pins here. One is just a pin at the front of the trigger group, the other is the safety pin. Once you pull those out, then you can gently lift the pistol grip assembly off. Now, on the original uh, German rifles, the fire control group was all built into the pistol grip handle. On this reproduction, it is all assembled on the receiver, and that is to meet ATF criteria uh, about making this not a machine gun. The issue is, if the fire control parts are all in here, it can theoretically be possible to fire the gun in full auto without having a... If you like take the pistol grip off and then run the thing, it'll fire because there's no sear in there to stop it. So in order to make sure that ATF considers this a semi-auto, the fire control group is redesigned to be all attached to the receiver. And by the way, the trigger pull on this first pattern gun is substantially nicer than on SMG's second pattern guns, which they, perhaps a little paradoxically, made first. So uh, we have a single return spring, that's your sear back there. This also only fires from a closed bolt, unlike the original guns, which fired from uh, either an open or closed bolt. As for the operation of the bolt itself, this video is getting long as it is, so uh, this works the exact same way as the previous SMG reproductions, as well as the original rifles. So I have a couple videos that cover um, the functioning of the bolt itself. So we'll leave that alone for now. If you look at the safety, you'll see that it's just a round pin. Normally a safety will have a flat on it somewhere that will interrupt or not interrupt some part of the firing mechanism. The way this one actually works is that this pin just goes in and acts to hold the fire control group on, and you'll see that there is a specific hole for safe, and when this pin is lined up with that safe uh, hole, the end of the pin locks into the back of the sear here, which holds it in this position and prevents it from moving. When the rifle's in the fire position, and this is actually going to dry fire here, you can see that as I pull the trigger this sear pivots and then fires right there. So as long as the safety's in, well, as long as the safety's in and being held in place by the fire control, uh, by the, the pistol grip here, then uh, that prevents the sear from moving, which gives you a nice effective safety. One other tip for reassembly, and this goes for uh, original FGs as well as reproductions, do not forget to put the charging handle in before you push the bolt all the way forward and let it lock. Once the bolt locks, if you don't have the charging handle in place, it's a real pain to get this pushed back against spring pressure here uh, so that you can bring the whole thing back far enough to put the charging handle in. In January of 1944, the Luftwaffe <laughs> the Luftwaffe ordered 120,000 of these rifles, and was going to plan on getting them at like 10 or 12,000 per month, which like so many of the German production goals, or like stated plans by 1944 or 45, that was completely ludicrous and nothing like it would ever come to pass. Um, they would redesign a new stamped version of the FG42, um, that's called generally called the second pattern, or uh, if you want to get really specific, it's the Type G, because there was actually an intermediate version between this and the late pattern. If you want more information on that, the book to get is the collector grade book uh, called Death From Above. At any rate, um, uh, in total about 8500 FG42s would be produced, just 2000 of this early pattern, the rest of them being later pattern guns. Uh, they would have no substantial impact on the actual outcome of the war because of their small-scale production, uh, but they went on to influence a number of designs, most substantially uh, the US M60, which uses, uh, well, which starts from the action of an FG42 coupled with the top cover from a German MG42. Anyway, that's a subject for a separate video. 
Hopefully you guys enjoyed taking a look at this reproduction, it is a beautiful gun and magnificently made and it's super cool, and I am looking forward to taking it out to do some shooting with, namely tomorrow when I'm going to take this sucker to a two gun match and see how it runs. So stay tuned for that, thanks for watching.